Thank you everyone for having me today. Um, normally this is a beautiful drive out, but today it's a little smoky. Um, so first, before I begin, um, just a, a great deep of appreciation for all the work that you do to continue to serve your communities, to make sure that your doors are open um, and services are being provided to your communities, especially to those who need services. In the healthcare arena, hospitals are the only entity, the only way of getting care seven days a week, uh, 365 days a year. I mean, you used to be able to say the postal will deliver rain, sleet, or snow. Well, hospitals will be there when you need them. They are the cornerstones of your communities. They are the, the rock beds of many of your economic development. They employ over 70,000 employees um, directly and over 150,000 um, indirectly into the community. So they are the solid cornerstones for many places. I will say COVID has shocked and rocked all of our worlds, especially at the lives that we live in today. It has impacted the way we work, the way we uh, go to school. Um, it has impacted the way we shop, the way we travel, um, impact, impact the way we interact with each other. Um, to to um, say that hospitals were not rocked in that particular wave of COVID, we were. Uh, some people will say COVID is over.
no longer need to be in our bed as they cannot get discharged to a lower whether that be because they have a high behavioral health need, can't my placement there. There's no room to take them. They hospital about its capacity, there's no community of that available. Or maybe it's because they just need a still in the kitchen. A still in the kitchen still be there and go on the kitchen. So we are not being able to discharge them. I think the most frightening for a year for me was the one around that last number, that 484. 484 patients a who are residing in an acute care bed that don't need to be there. That's equivalent to Adventist children, to legacy and natural. And that's what is one large system, hospital, hospital to serve patients. What impact the care of the patients? The second one is the sharing of the routine of starting down. Um, goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. So I think we can talk about how we got here. Maybe there were some other We've seen increases in our costs throughout the pandemic. That's flat revenue, even though it's a patient. They have also there are other factors involved in that as well, uh, such as acuity of patients and the ability to move patients to the uh, bigger system. But it's been uh, it's the first time I've seen those two reversed. So while we are always open, sometimes we have to say one more. That has to do with this the inability to discharge our patients. And we have seen a significant increase in the length of stay. Um, in the emergency room visits, we saw a sharp decline from our previous quarter, um, showing about 7.3% decrease compared to Q3. Uh, there are still too many patients in our EDs waiting to get admitted into the hospital or waiting to be transferred to the lower acute system. And so with this length of stay, we're beginning to see it continue that pressure looking up into our into our um, into impacting our workforce. And one of the slides that we that I missed at the beginning was a um, kind of a circular path motion of the, the cycle of our workforce right now. 
When we started COVID, when we went into COVID, we had the initial scare. We none of us knew what COVID was. There was the nervousness around the lack of PPE or the availability of PPE. That caused stress on our workforce. Our workforce began to know necessarily what the outcomes of COVID was going to be. They saw a lot of it hurt, fully down, um, and patients being alone. That stress creates early retirements um, that we were not necessarily expecting, creating new nurses, new healthcare providers to come in and then leave. We created an opportunity for travelers to come in. While travelers are expensive, they can also be disruptive to the culture of the organization, and they can also create additional um, cultural differences between those that are employed and the travelers that we So we kept seeing this vicious cycle. But one piece of that cycle that we haven't been able to tackle yet is the education piece. Nurses, when they go in there, hired to take on, say, labor and delivery, they are trained for that particular job. They want to go to that job because that is what they want, they've been practicing to do. Well, we are asking them to take on different roles. Maybe we're asking that labor and delivery nurse now to play a skill nurse and play the role of the type of level of care that one would receive receive in a skilled nursing facility. That's not what he or she was trained for. They're not happy about that. And that continues to feed into our workforce challenges. So that's that on the, on the practice side of healthcare, what's happening here. Um, I do think there are some opportunities. I think there are some opportunities for folks to be creative and come to the table and start navigating the healthcare system. And some of that has to do with the political environment that we're in. We are 19 days from November 8th, which is election day, and I hope we're all registered to vote, especially those here in Oregon, and I hope you all plan on voting. You will receive your ballots if you haven't already sometime this week. Your voter pamphlets you should have already received. I hope you all read them thoroughly. Um, do what you need to, but don't waste a lot of time. Um, this is where I, this is my bill, the medical environment. Um, and this is where I think we have some great opportunity for hospitals uh, here in Oregon. So let's talk about how this election is shaping up and what some of those opportunities might be. At the national level, it is a midterm. Um, typically, at this time, a midterm election, the president's party does not necessarily fare very well. Um, they may be... Um, not turning out their votes. They may be complacent with what's going on. And the opposite, the other party usually has a higher turnout of voters. So we're watching that. So that means that if Republicans have an opportunity, they all can call out the red wave that might come through Oregon or across the, the country. Um, we can talk a little bit about that if that is, is of interest. Um, some of the deciding factors into this election is the economy. Um, the economy and inflation of uh, people at the national and at the state level are very upset about the impact that it's having on their personal personal checkbooks. We still have a war in Ukraine going on, and that's definitely in people's minds of what's going on there. And then we had a decision out of the Supreme Court uh, against Roe versus Wade, and that has energized um, the base, the democratic base, to get out to vote. On the other side, the more local side, of what's happening here in Oregon, um, the polling that we have done shows a really strong dissatisfaction in the, in the direction the state is going. And you can correlate that with Kate Brown's, Governor Brown's um, lack of enthusiasm for her. Her disapproval rating is the highest in the, in the country. She is the least liked governor, which is hard for me to believe because if you know her, she's nice. 
Um, she's a fun, she's energetic, she's a little, she's, she's a cheerleader for the city. But she has lost a lot of faith from some of her partners, from some of her own base, um, because of the way that she managed um, the COVID uh, the last three years. So that had played a role into this election. Um, the other part is the, the big issues that many of us are facing or seeing um, in our own communities. Almost this top issue amongst the candidates right now comes up at every event. It's one of their key principles that they all stand on. They must address small business. You also have the cost of living. I don't know about you, but I don't like going to the gas tanks anymore. Uh, <laughs> That's scary for me. Um, and then crime, crime is up. Healthcare, healthcare is actually lower on the list. Um, here in Oregon, um, the, the jobs decision also is pretty low. Um, you could also kind of combine the two together, uh, or healthcare, public healthcare. Education is also a top of mind for, for folks in this election, especially when you look at Graduation rates are still declining. Um, we, we still have young kids who are going through a lot of um, COVID effects. And then they've been out of school. They lack the social interaction and engagement. Um, some are even behind in their grades. So if we look at what this election means in the Senate here in Oregon. Uh, Peter Courtney, who is the Senate president, is uh, stepping down. He is the longest Senate president in Oregon. He has been there, well, it seems like forever, but he's been there for almost 20 years in that role. He will be stepping down. Um, it is not likely that um, we know who the president elect will be for the Senate, and that's because the elections have yet to come. And if Senator Pinot, who is currently the majority leader of the Senate, has his way, he will become an excellent president, meaning that he will pick up enough seats to overturn um, the Democratic image. I think if the elections were today, I think if they put the Republicans close that gap, some of that uh, national feeling towards would be changed, the, the ability of Republicans to really paint a Democrat um, akin to Governor Brown that will help with that. And, and so I think folks are looking at balance, they want change. So I think instead of really seeing a flip in the Senate, I do think we'll see that gap closed, um, probably down to 16 Democrats to 14 Republicans. And that will assume that the two um, that are in green, you are two independents come home to their own place. So that takes away the Democrat supermajority. It also means that they will have to work with Republicans if they would like to have uh, a bill passed. They don't have to, but they're going to need to work with Boston. Then in the House, House has brand new leadership as of the beginning of this year. When uh, Tina Cota stepped down from her role as speaker to run for governor, let the House elect Bill Representative Dan Graybill from Corvallis. Dan is fairly young in the, in the legislature. Um, he has been through a couple of cycles and he has quickly ascended to the leadership role. He was previously the Ways and Needs co chair, so having a gavel of her over the state's budget and would be a lot of trust amongst his colleagues to put him into his leadership role. That role has to be voted upon, just like the Senate president role, it has to be voted upon by the floor. So every member of the chamber gets to vote and they have to have a majority. At least there was a majority of Democrats that elected him. He did have some Republicans. He does work well across the aisle and many of his colleagues Appreciate his inclusiveness in his thinking, in his decision making, in the way he operates. The majority leader, uh, Representative Julie Bailey uh, from Eugene, she's fairly um, new to leadership. 
Um, does she have a good acumen of the politics, which is that role of jury leader in the in the House Democratic political person? And so she'll go around and she knows how to look votes and count votes, um, probably better than anyone else that I know. And then Representative Vicki Breeze Iverson was elected um, or by her peers to be the minority uh, leader in the House. Uh, Vicki comes from Eastern or Central Oregon. Um, she has been a lobbyist in the past. She's, she has grown up in on the lobby side before she a legislative. In the House, they still have a, a significant uh, lead over Republicans. Um, I think that if we were to do the vote today, they probably close that lead uh, by a few. I think the final vote um, in the House would be 34 Democrats to 26 Republicans. So they'll pick up a couple of seats. Every race is extremely competitive. And um, anything that can happen between now and the grade. So, if we look at the uh, governor's race, the you one know, that I think is the most interesting and definitely the most um, advertised right now on the news, if you are watching regular TV, um, is the governor's race. And this is really a race uh, between three strong, smart women. Uh, former Speaker of the House, Tina Kotek, former um, co-chair of the Ways and Means, or former tri-chair of the Ways and Means, uh, Senator Betsy Johnson, and former minority uh, House leader, Representative Christine Joyson. So the three of them are in a very competitive race. Um, the most recent polling that I have seen, it shows um, Drazen up by two percentage points. Um, we have seen other polling in the past that had around by six points. Um, most recent Democratic polls, so it's funded by Tina's campaign and then published by her campaign, that showed Tina up by two points. So it goes back and forth between the two of them. Johnson is a still very competitive. Um, I liked her comment last night when asked about if she is a spoiler in this race. She said, no, she's not. That's Tina. She thinks she is very good at the race. And she is a very strong voice um, for more moderate Democrats. She seems to be pulling from the Democratic base from those who may not want to side with um, Tina Kirchner. So go further to the left. But they can't because of um, reproductive right issues support raising. So she does become a, a place where folks land. There are many Republicans that are going to follow her as well because of their position on either guns or on reproductive rights. So she has a very tight race between the, the three of them uh, for the first time in close to 40 years. This is at this point in the election. Um, we see a Republican that has momentum, and we see a Republican who actually could possibly. All that being said, you look at history in this state, and you look at the number of those who are registered in the state, it looks like Tina will, will end up with representative and speaker project. So, what do we anticipate seeing out of this election besides just number of shifting? Um, we are going to see about two thirds of the legislature being ran. A third that will be sworn in for the first time, another third that has been through one short session, but never through a full long session that we are about ready to go into, um, and one that has been in person. They will not know how to interact with the lobby. And that is a big frame. So as a as a registered lobbyist, um, that's frightening because most of our time interacting with legislators is walking them to a committee, walking them to the floor, catching them as they're getting out of the committee back to the office. It is that elevator 
moment that you have with them. And COVID didn't have that. That was probably the most frustrating part about COVID for the longest, and, and maybe even more right now because of Jim Home, is that we couldn't connect with um, those who were taking votes, those who were having a hearing in in any form. We could do it Zoom, but their Zoom schedules were booked out two or three weeks after we needed them their attention. So they will not know how to interact with us. They will be lost in that capital, meaning that the capital is still under construction. And so they will not have access to hiding places. We won't have access to hiding places without them. But the capital will be open. Um, we'll have to figure out how we're going to interact together and work together during this session. And it, it will be a, a little bit of a frenzy, I think, at first. So we're also going to see a huge new class in, 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 in I think, really elevating um, Oregon's diversity in the legislature. We will have several new members joining the BIPOC committee in caucus. We will see different backgrounds coming into educational and professional backgrounds coming into the legislature. Um, we will have an increase in professional healthcare professionalists who are coming in, dentists, physicians, nurses, and hospital trustee, and optometrists. They are all coming to, to represent. It doesn't mean they're always going to be good for us on our issues when we're in front of them, but at least they will have a, a better base understanding of the issue. And then um, when we look at the makeup of leadership, if, if the House holds, I don't see any change in that leadership there. Um, we will continue to see um, BIPOC representation um, in committee chairs and uh, potentially in, um, in, in their hierarchy of their, their leadership. When it comes to the Senate, I think the Senate is completely up to grabs. When it comes to leadership, there are about six, I think, individuals on the Senate Democrat side who are vying for that role and trying to count their own votes right now. But many of those are being dependent on some very um, competitive races and races that could impact their ability to become the percent of them. So, what's at stake for hospitals? Uh, this is the first time in 10 years that we've had a true transition. At four, four hospitals and in four Melbourne. Um, the last significant transition we did was between Kulinowski and um, Kitzhaber. Kitzhaber's third time term. So this will be the first real transition that we have gone Under a Brown administration, or under, under a Kotec administration, we will have to do some significant up there. Uh, Speaker Kotek, um, potentially Governor Kotek, is not necessarily a fan of hospitals. If you heard the debate in Ben, um, she sided with labor and said that she does not support hospital CEOs and hospital executives. That caught our attention just a little bit. Um, and so we will continue to have I think, difficulties with her. If, if she were elected as well. Our plan of action, though, with her is to ask for a reason. Yeah, as speaker, she may have not have been our friend, but as governor, she needs to at least listen to one with us. So we will ask for a reason. If not. Under a Johnson or even a Drazen uh, administration, we will have our book of how we would like to operate our healthcare policies. And our healthcare agenda in hand to hand over to them uh, once they are assumed into office. They will be more friendly to us. They won't always be on our side, but they will definitely be more friendly. So, the important part about a governor and how it impacts the way the state is governed is that they have the opportunity to really designate who are the leaders of the agencies that um, they would like to oversee. And we'll see where they put their priorities. Um, if healthcare is a priority for either 
many of the potential governors um, who will have that person be placed with the health authority pretty quickly. They do have to be confirmed by the Senate. So the makeup of the Senate will depend on who that person is as well. Um, if it is a partisan person that is nominated, then they may have a harder time getting through the Senate. So that's a calculation that the governor will have to make when she gets her performance role. That also means we're going to have a significant lag time. Um, OHA for many of us has not been um, always responsive on a lot of issues that we have needed them to respond to. Other issues they have been extremely responsive on. So they too will have to go through a change. And depending on how quickly that change can happen will depend on how swiftly things are going to take place. You mentioned the uh, two thirds departure of legislators and new legislators coming on. That is a huge brain drain for the system. That's an opportunity, though, for us to get out and educate legislators and candidates on our issues, what's important to us, help them understand the difference between Medicaid and Medicare. Um, and sometimes it is that basic. But it's also an opportunity to help them see the vision that we would like to see when we have to here and potentially um, help them get to be champions for our issues. And then, of course, um, new leadership brings in potentially new policies. And the new policies that we could anticipate seeing, depending on the administration, uh, may look like this. I think we are concerned around um, value-based payment and rate setting uh, under a project administration, less worried about those under a Trace and Johnson administration. The bridge plan that is very much in works right now, conversations and the work that OHA is leading a task force down is in play. Under a project administration, that will continue to be in play and move forward. Under a Johnson or Drayton campaign, um, that will probably be curtailed. I don't think it goes away, but I think it is curtailed. And I think the impact that they are projecting on the budget that, that will have, the state budget that is, um, may, may curtail it itself. So cost growth target will also be a priority under, under a COTEC um, administration as well as universal health care um, and other potential regulatory issues. So what are some of the issues that we're going to be watching for under, under any of our administrations is really looking at the cost growth target, that 3.4% uh, benchmark that hospitals are insured, it's large clinics that are all subject to meet, looking at how that is continued to be rolled out, uh, maybe leading a delay under a Brown or Johnson administration. Uh, we're going to be looking at value based payments. How can you do one or the other? How can you do both at the same time? We need to have some really deep policy conversations around that. When it comes to recovery for the healthcare system, the workforce is going to be our priority tied to the financial stability of our hospitals. And we will tie that up by calling it, how do we preserve access to care? Because we can't have, we don't have workforce. We don't have the ability to serve our community. We're not able to serve our community. We definitely don't have a problem. So we are going to make those connections for legislators um, throughout our policy positions as we move forward. And then um, I think we also, the continuing efforts of the modernization of public health and EMS. Uh, COVID did point folks and holes into our public health, health system. Um, we do at some point have to look at modernizing our system so that it is not as complex as it currently is. And so we anticipate having that conversation and we want to be part of it. 
We don't always look at health schools as being part of the truck as part of the EMS system. And so we need to make sure that we are doing that. So our priorities for this session, um, as I mentioned, the hospital financial availability, stability, making sure that our hospitals can continue to keep their doors open, not just for today and tomorrow, but for the next generation. Uh, we'll be looking at how do we support and recruit um, and retain our workforce, um, and, and how do we continue um, to look at policy through um, ensuring that we have access to care. So we do have a couple policy proposals that didn't make it onto this slide that include a per diem for hospitals uh, who are boarding patients or who are at delayed discharge of patients. Well, that is one legislative concept that we have asked to be introduced. We have a suite of, um, I would call them workforce development and retention bills. Uh, one is to look at a tax credit for nurse educators. We don't have an availability of nursing seats because we don't have enough nurse educators. We don't have enough nurse educators because there is a significant drop in pay um, for it to be the bedside to take in a teaching job. So how can we incentivize and how can we help bridge that gap? Maybe through a tax credit that will help move folks into the nurse education event. We also are looking at a placement, a clinical placement um, incentive or yeah, incentive. How that is structured, we don't know yet. But that would be an incentive for hospitals to take in clinical placements and get reimbursed at a little bit of a higher rate for those, um, those patients first for those clinical placements. And then the other one is offering scholarships to help them strengthen the power of the workforce. Our workforce is very talented. They are highly educated, highly skilled. Um, and we know that it takes time, but if there's a way for us to help offset some of those costs that they may be incurring, um, then we would like to be able to ask the state to help us with that. We will also be putting forth a, a bill regarding the nurse staffing law. We have two of them. One is the total repeal of the nurse staffing law. The other one is a modified reversion of that for staffing law. That is really to counter what our labor partners are doing, which is putting more in your staffing ratios. And I had, let's say, the pleasure, I'm not sure it was the pleasure, um, of looking at their preview of what they are, what they are proposing. They're looking at their staffing ratios in 12 specific units. They are asking that we expand our inner staffing committee, not just to one, but add three more staffing committees. Um, so my internal joke, and I'll make sure this internally, is that um, if we're always in committees, how do we see patients? I mean, that's a lot of work that they're asking. And I think there might be better ways of accomplishing labor's goal and objective of getting their voice heard. <laughs> At a staffing level, versus having to have staffing committees, which I think in its nature, or at least the current version of the nature, um, creates additional rift and uh, tension between labor and hospitals. So, it looks scary ahead of us. I don't mean for it to look scary. There is great opportunity. Um, and some of that opportunity that starts with all of you. Um, I know that I have come in the past to talk to you about being engaged. I'm asking you again to be engaged. I think it's important that you are the expert in your field to help educate your elected officials on the challenges that your hospital faces, that your community is facing and has to help them. And so you are the better sports person than me when it comes to this in front of the legislature. They need your vote. They don't need my vote. But I need their vote. You need their vote. So I think there is some great opportunity there. Um, we've also heard that if it's not you, part of your team is you. They're great at advocating on your 
um, organization to be in. There needs to be some coordination there when that happens, but happy to be part of that if you think that is something you want to do. And that is my presentation. So happy to answer questions, to engage in dialogue on any of that that I've presented or others. Um, in terms of problems with staffing um, and intention, uh, you didn't you acknowledge the issue of vaccine mandates for staff and driving out a lot of nursing and um, you know allied health professionals. I'd like to comment. Sure. So the question was around what was the impact of the required vaccines on the nursing as well as the allied health. So we did ask our members where they were. Each hospital obviously complied with the, the state's mandate with the vaccine requirement. What I will say is that every hospital responded to Some hospitals lost their nurses, lost the allied health, others added to their program. Um, each hospital addressed it differently, and they had the ability to do that. Some found waivers that worked for their staff. Um, others were not able to do that. It has had a effect in some area, areas of the state greater than others. And I think those states, those areas of the state that are seeing um, significant use of travelers right now, are continuing to build that mandate. That mandate will stay in place for as long as Brown and Florida protest are in the office. Um, I was wondering from a, another kind of labor question related to ONA. I imagine ONA has lobbyists as well. Um, and some of our facilities may or may not be coming up to union negotiations and start talking about retention and, and financial stability. I'm wondering on how they are speaking to the idea of what how far they're gonna go. You know, I think of like Seattle Children's at their union negotiation and paying nurses ninety dollars an hour. It doesn't really pose well for financial stability. I think that's a great question. Many of you are or have gone through this labor negotiation. I don't know. Labor is still on the mindset that a hospital has really deep pockets. They don't believe the finances. And I will, we have one youth legislator who is an RN. Um, they are on the healthcare committee. They are actively speaking for nurses. And this individual is a Washington State Nurses Association negotiator. So when we meet with them on a regular basis, and Old saying, keep your friends close and keep your enemies closer. We keep, we keep them pretty close. And um, we are trying to build that relationship with them. It does come at a, a cost. He thinks he can negotiate with us as if he's negotiating with the hospital, individual hospital. We need him to take that hat off when he comes to our table and talk to us. We have to be able to talk about the policy of the state and the impact it's going to have on the system. If their requests are too high, the system will close. If the system is closed, where are they going to work? So I think we have to continue to push back. They do want to see everything. They want to see more days cash on hand. And they want to go back in time. 
That was it on this day? What was it on this day? I'm not exactly sure what they're trying to do from that, but that is what they are asking for in my most recent conversation. It's what is your cash goes on account? Um, labor, when they are out there advocating, they are advocating for safer staffing levels. That is code for ratios. How we address that, that is a state level issue. Um, I saw their legislation today. I, we will be sending out a survey to all our members around what it looks like for your hospital, trying to gather that information so that we can be really prepared to respond, uh, showing the numbers of how many beds that may close, how many services that we reduce, how many more nurses do we have to bring on, in order to meet those standards. Nurses are not inexpensive, and they are not going on trees. Um, where we're going to get them, I don't know. But we do have to have those conversations, and we have to at least paint the picture for a legislator that this is their choice. They have to make a decision if we go with ratios, or do we allow for what we currently have today, which is a negotiated uh, staff and level by the by hospital by hospital. Um, in terms of what they are continuing to ask for, Oregon is the third highest paying um, average for a nurse in the country. I think that's a good deal to use, but that may not be the best in the negotiation that we may be going to. Uh, they have seen significant leadership change at ONA. Their new executive director is very much labor forward. She um, comes from the Washington State Nurses Association. She was the one who led their campaign on nurse ratios of Washington. Um, I mentioned that uh, there is a representative who is very close to them. He's a former board member of theirs. And you also have the chair of the House Health Care Committee, who is a former negotiator. Um, he is more moderate in his approach and he listens. But I do think labor has uh, the ear of many, many Democrats. They also have the ear of many Republicans. There is a sympathy out there for our frontline workers right now that has, that has prevailed over data points. And I, I think the one issue that um, we are all looking at retention and wanting to do more work for our workforce, it is looking at how can we better support their well-being. Um, and that's not just by giving them an app to use, but that is providing some meaningful uh, physical and mental activity really um, services. That's a great question. Um, when we look at the healthcare system in Oregon, I think I saw a statistic a couple of years ago, public safety, that Oregon has the fewest beds per capita of age adjusted in the state. And I still have recently completed an expansion of adding 150 beds or something like that. But to my knowledge, there's no other big system to adding more beds. Um, is, is there any thought about how to add? So that's a huge access point, you know, um, a huge, huge problem. Uh, as a small facility, we can't uh, transfer. Sometimes we're transferring out of state. Uh, we just don't have beds in the state. Is there any thought of how to uh, incentivize or, or uh, programmatically uh, help facilitate, you know, more construction? Our population is getting older in the state. Um, a lot of retirees are coming in. Um, the demand on the healthcare services and, and the bed capacity is going to keep growing for the next 30 to 50 years. And we don't have enough beds, and if no one's building, how are we going to manage that? That seems to be top priority in the state if we're going to think about this, not just this year, but for the next 50 years. So you're absolutely right. We do have the lowest bed per capita in the country. Um, that was our partially by design. I think it wasn't expected that we would have had a three-year pandemic. 
in the state that would have created such capacity issues. So with the capacity, there are a couple of things. There's a bit of issue, there are a couple of things. First, we are a substitute of the state. So any expansion that we want to go through, we have to uh, go through the uh, very public process and apply for a certificate it is needed. We do not look at the number of beds in comparison to population. Our population has grown. Yeah. So we're going to wrap up. So help with the study five years ago, or seven years ago, looking at we can go to the um, uh, the Census Bureau and they can project uh, the number of patients by demographic, age demographic for like the next 50 to 60 years. And so their justification, they went through and looked at the number of admissions per thousand at each of these age groups. And as we know, a 65 year old who enters Medicare doesn't use much that capacity, but by the time they're 85, they use a lot. And so uh, by design, I don't understand that concept of by design, we have two beds because the data is out there. The map is pretty straightforward and easy. There's something like from 65 to 69, uh, Medicare patients have like 143 admissions per thousand. Uh, by the time they're, you know, 80 to 84, it's something like uh, 400 or 380 admissions per thousand. So, I mean, that math is pretty easy to do. I don't understand the by design, I guess. Um, so, the by design comment was related to if you look back a couple of decades from now. We have always had a certificate process in place. So that's the design that prohibits us from going out and creating. The other part is you have to have capital resources to do Last I heard, um, it's not cheap to go and do anything like that. It takes significant planning and resources for them. We also have to have staff. That's the other challenge, right? So if you are able to build, if you are able to expand capacity, you do have to have required staff, soon to be ratios in the state to build. If you don't have the staff to build, you can't be accessed. So there are a couple of different levers that have to line up just right, which oftentimes probably makes it more difficult um, for some to, to expand. Okay. So in talking to the state, the comment is that Portland itself, when it comes to beds, is gone. You know, everybody wants to go to Portland or if you want to go outside of Portland, that's where we're actually going. That's what we're going to start. We're going to start to get them. I'm going to have one more question concerning and this. I think I should start it. Uh, this is really important. Um, I think there's common spirit had a big data breach. Is it common spirit? One of these kids, and it took like a $1.2 billion hit, uh, with a cool hit for uh, just immediately that. Um, is there any discussion around uh, helping organizations with cybersecurity efforts? Um, a lot of small facilities such as ourselves. We, we, you know, we're looking at that same man, which is, uh, you know, just the, the potential liability in the static area is very, very uh, ominous and, and uh, threatening. I have not heard of any financial assistance of any kind to this place. So, even in the security. Thanks for coming out. Appreciate it. Um, just curious, what if the most supplies is that? I'm not sure how much work uh, the associations had a chance to really jump in. And you see at this time, you know, 10 months into it, or whatever, maybe seven or so months ago, when we started, and we did it to a gender, you know, a couple of months after. Are you seeing any providers struggling to meet the script streaming timeframes? To initiate and um, negotiate and create, I think, under federal law, there were 30 days from the denial to say, hey, we need a skew. And then after that period, four days to initiate the IVR process. And have you created resources showing, for instance, the DLF issue a, 
open negotiated form that they can use to initiate that. Has that happened? What have you heard to see them? I think it's a great question. What I will say is before the No Surprises Act, Oregon already had a, a similar No Surprises Act. Um, it did not necessarily include hospitals in that version of the Now the No Surprise Act does. Um, and I have not heard from our hospitals directly uh, if they are challenged with that. I know that our partners with the American Hospital Association has done a lot of work with that right now. And I know that our contract for federal folks that we contract with the BBC uh, keep us pretty much advised with as the association for the contract for the treatment. I got a lot back there. But I will close by saying please remember to vote. Your vote does make money, it does count. You get 19 days before the election. And I'm going to get a